So, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, thank you very much for being here. Uh, this ceremony we're going to start right now uh, with the welcome uh, from our Dean, Professor Linos Alexandro Sicilianos. We are very honored for your presence here, Mr. Dean. So the floor is yours for initial welcome. Thank you. The honor is all mine, and uh, my great pleasure to be with you today. I know that you have made a great effort, and we are arriving in, at the end of uh, this uh, academic year uh, of this uh, LLM, which is extremely important for the law faculty. Uh, it is an Anglophone LLM, and it is uh, a sign of our, uh, let us say, projection uh, outside Greece and uh, in the international sphere, uh, the international academic sphere. So we very much uh, count uh, on, on your participation and on the participation of uh, uh, distinguished colleagues from, uh, from uh, other law schools and universities and uh, of a number of uh, uh, my colleagues uh, from the different departments of, uh, of this law school. And uh, of course, uh, um, we are delighted that uh, this program arrives uh, to an end in excellent conditions and that we have accomplished it. You have accomplished it. You have made a great effort in order to arrive here today. And uh, uh, also, I'm delighted about the event of today uh, on the issue of digital economy and uh, um, the challenges of uh, competition law. Uh, this is a very new subject, a very progressive subject. We have the pleasure to have with us uh, two colleagues. Uh, I would like to draw your attention, you know it perhaps already, uh, by to, to, a, to a monography by Professor Mikrulea, who has uh, uh, published a very extensive book of more than 1,000 pages on, on those issues. And uh, uh, we have uh, had the pleasure uh, to present it uh, some, some weeks ago. And um, uh, she's a specialist in the field. And uh, uh, so we are, we are very pleased that uh, the, the event as a whole will take place with, with uh, other colleagues specializing in, in this particular field. And so I would like to, to welcome you all and to uh, uh, say that uh, uh, we wish you a very bright future to our students. And uh, uh, we are very, very happy uh, to be with you and to follow your progress afterwards, uh, whether you, you continue um, uh, with doctoral studies or with, uh, uh, with your uh, career paths. And uh, I very much encourage you to, to follow the, the path you really wish and you love and to follow your heart and not the indications or, or recommendations of uh, uh, parents or friends and so on, your own heart uh, in order to continue uh, with your own career path. So thank you so much and uh, all my best wishes. Thank you very much, Mr. Dean. Uh, and now we'll pass the floor uh, to Professor uh, Evi Papartiniu, who is director of our LLM program. Uh, and she will also give a welcome. Would you like to use the yeah. podium? Thank you very much. Uh, I see familiar faces here, so I'm very, very glad and very happy uh, to welcome you to this closing ceremony. Uh, some of you, perhaps you remember, we had the opening ceremony. Uh, it was a very, very, um, uh, very nice atmosphere. So we thought we could combine that with two distinguished lecturers here that are going to have the presentations about digital economy and competition law challenges, and then drink a glass of wine. Uh, today, we also had uh, our graduation ceremony of the past academic year, the students uh, uh, of 2021-2022 and uh, I had um, a small speech and I invited them to, um, to establish a new alumni club. This is something that you might be interested to join to because uh, after some months you are going to be also alumni of our LLM program and of our law school so you are also invited to do that and I hope that you really enjoyed this uh, uh, LLM program. This is a uh, rather new uh, program, the first English taught program uh, at the University uh, of uh, at the Law School of the University of Athens. 
And uh, I would like only to say that is, this is a privilege for us to have students from all around the world. And we really sincerely hope to expand this LLM program in the future, in the years to come. Thank you very much for being here. And thank you very much for the, to the professors as well, because without the professors, the program doesn't uh, function. So thank you very much to, that you are all here today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Proporcenio. Uh, so today I'm very happy because uh, you see this is a, a panel which is characterized by woman power. Eh? Uh, and I think that competition law is somehow uh, dominated by uh, women also in the European, on the European level, uh, Margaret uh, Vestager and as well Lina Khan uh, in the United States. So, uh, the main theme of our today's ceremony is digital economy and competition law challenges. Um, okay, we all know that uh, digital economy is a brave new world. Uh, it embraces digital smart contracts, digital property rights, digital currencies, that is cryptocurrencies, even digital firms, as I read recently, or digital autonomous organizations, such as DAO, which is a venture capital fund that was built on the Ethereum blockchain. So there are many digital entities. However, even if the, in this digital economy and in, in this digital world, competition is still essential for the operation of markets. Uh, for amongst others, it fuels the forces of creative distraction, which according to Joseph Schumpeter, uh, are the drivers of economic progress. But what about regulation as well? Uh, what about setting some limits to these newcomers in the field? So, without further ado, I would like to introduce you our first speaker for today, uh, Katerina Linos. Katerina uh, has honored me with her friendship. Uh, she's a law professor at UC Berkeley School of Law. Uh, she's the co-faculty director of Miller Institute for Global Challenges and the Law at UC Berkeley. She teaches international uh, business transactions, international law, European Union law, and international organizations. In her research, she combines legal doctrine with empirical work. She has also done important work on refugees and technology through a Carnegie Fellowship. In the area of antitrust law, she has co authored with Adam Chilton and Enu Bradford the book The Global Dominance of European Competition Law over American Antitrust Law. She will build on that work today to discuss the global reach of competition and antitrust law, in particular as it is applied to the regulation of technology giants such as Apple, Facebook, Meta, and Google. As we all know, competition law is a powerful tool available to governments to regulate global challenges. While business activity, both legal and illegal, is truly international, the reach of government regulation is typically limited by the principles of nationality and territoriality. That is, as the argument of Katerina goes, it is generally very difficult for a government to stop a foreign firm from harmful activities abroad. Today, uh, the woman California-based tech giants such as Facebook, Google, Apple, and Meta fear most is not Lina Khan, as Katerina indicates, the chair of the American Federal Trade Commission, but rather Margaret Vestager, the EU's Commission lead, competition lead. Wide-ranging EU competition laws have major benefits not only for European citizens, but also for citizens around the world. Katerina will argue for regulation. I don't know, we'll see later uh, the position of uh, Alexandra, but let's hear first the one side. Uh, Katerina, the floor is yours. Thank you very much.
lecturer at uh, the University of California, Berkeley, as Professor Cavado so generously introduced me. And it's truly a delight to be able to speak at the end of a private international law LLM program to connect uh, several of the themes we typically cover in this field with the biggest challenge going forward, uh, digital technology. So what I will start uh, is by explaining how we might think of possible ways to regulate Google, Apple, Facebook, Meta, their Chinese equivalents, which are even more concentrated, and why the typical legal tools we have uh, aren't necessarily suitable. So in um, international business transactions, uh, I'll start just with kind of some key players uh, to suggest that kind of one peculiar feature is why do we look to antitrust law rather than tax law or corporate law or the law of technology? Why is that the tool? And why is it in particular European antitrust law rather than Chinese or American, given that the big tech giants are not uh, European? Why is it, as this contrast suggests, that the woman who strikes fear in Silicon Valley is Margrethe Feshtager, whereas Lena Khan, who has these uh, phenomenal ideas, does not seem to succeed when it comes uh, to implementing them. Another way uh, to think about this is to turn not only to these two new bodies of law that uh, the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act that will regulate everything about technology, but to the newest issue, artificial intelligence. Many of us now use ChatGPT and are trying to think about all the possible applications. Why is it that EU lawmakers will have uh, an act on the books shortly, whereas Americans have a blueprint that is very unlikely uh, to become law. A final uh, way to start is to think about fines, to think about uh, aggressive enforcement, to think about ex post regulation rather than ex ante regulation. Sometimes big numbers catch the headline, so the particular number I'll put in front of you is 14 billion. That's the amount uh, that Apple has put in escrow pending a final decision from the European Court of Justice. Uh, the case is a peculiar one and a very interesting one because the two parties are not Apple and some government, it is Commission versus Ireland. Uh, so those are the three starting observations before I talk a little bit more generally about how else we could regulate these tech giants and these two peculiar features of the world in which we live. Um, so we might think that tech giants are so big because they pay no taxes. And in fact, whoever wins this decision, a global tax treaty is likely to emerge to change that. We might think um, that this is a problem of corporate governance, but as um, I'm sure kind of a central focus of uh, this LLM is that subsidiaries and foreign governments are subject to the local law. So if you want to regulate uh, the activity of a, an American subsidiary, um, it's, it's no longer an American firm, it's an Irish firm, a, a Dutch firm, it, it's subject to local law, so you can't do that. In international law, we generally have two principles of regulation, territoriality and nationality. So states can regulate anything that happens on their territory, as well as the conduct of their citizens, as well as natural persons and legal persons, and that's a really big limit. If the United States wants its companies not to bribe foreign officials, it does not want German companies to take their place. It wants to stop a bribe between a German company and a, the Greek government. But that's very difficult legally to do because of these principles. To the extent the US wants sanctions on Russia or Ukraine, it needs to stop trade from a variety of countries. And all of that is very much uh, limited by these two principles. In antitrust, we have something completely different and exceptional. We have something called the effects principle. If something through the price mechanism has effects on the American market, it comes within the jurisdiction of American authorities. This idea was fought by the Europeans for a very long time, and at some point they said, if we can't beat them, join them. It's now part of European law. Anything can influence uh, a country through the price mechanism. So antitrust has global reach in ways that other bodies of law do not. In addition, the European efforts are peculiar because unlike other areas of law in which national authorities 
have primary or complementary authorities, there is a lot of power in Brussels. And that power has been used extensively, uh, in part by Margrethe Festager most recently, but, but also by her predecessors. Uh, so that's a very key aspect of why European antitrust law is what uh, firms in uh, California, where we're from, fear uh, most. Uh, let me talk a little bit about this field of antitrust law in the most general terms. Uh, antitrust law is the American term for competition law. The goal of competition law is to enhance consumer welfare, to allow consumers to have a better choice of high quality and low cost products. For a while, tech companies were saying, look, we are offering everything for free. It can't get lower cost than free, so we have no antitrust problems. Lina Khan, among many others, said actually there are privacy costs when all this data is collected. There are costs to innovation when we have monopolists, just as we have in every other firm. You're saying there are no barriers to entry. Uh, anyone can set up a new tech company from their garage door. You can't set up a car company or an aircraft company uh, the same way, but we know those barriers to entry are very significant. Um, so now competition law is thought to apply straightforwardly to this new area, and it's a powerful tool. There are other reasons why competition law is important, uh, an effort to stop the aggregation not only of, of economic, but also political power in the European project to create a single market. In addition, most countries in the world now have some national form of US law. And what uh, my co-authors and I have established, and I'll show you some graphs, is that the model is European rather than American law. Uh, this is peculiar because the Americans pioneered modern competition law in the 1930s in an effort to stop the power of major oil companies and railroads from governing the countries in the 1930s. And the Europeans introduced competition law in the Treaty of Rome in 1958. But major developments that Professor Mikulea will talk about, such as pre-merger notification, did not become part of European law until 1990, so very late in the game. Nevertheless, it's the European model that has spread uh, globally. And to underscore kind of the, the ways in which US and EU applies extraterritorially, uh, it is the case that mergers between two American companies that have been approved by the American authorities have been blocked by the European authorities or the European authorities have put very onerous conditions on those mergers. So that's one key tool that Professor McCulley will elaborate on and uh, develop. Um, some of the original empirical work I've done with Professor Shelton and um, Bradford had to do with what type of competition law uh, has spread around the world. Um, let me show you some uh, I'll give you the very basics of European competition law and then show why this has spread around the world. Um, so over 130 jurisdictions of the 190 that might exist have competition law, so every large market exists. Uh, the typical anti-competitive uh, behavior is a cartel agreement or the abuse of a dominant position by uh, a merger, and they are commonly effects-based prohibitory regimes. More specifically, EU law prohibits cartels and collusive agreements between firms. It prohibits monopolies uh, from abusing their dominant position. The 1990 merger regulation says before you complete a deal, you need to get approval from antitrust authorities. What is peculiar about European law is that competition law also encompasses state aids. So in other countries, governments Subsidies are outside the scope of competition law. Uh, subsidies and taxes are economically equivalent. This is the reason uh, why we have this very big case, uh, Commission versus Ireland. The European Commission is telling the Irish government, hey, you need to collect more revenue to the tune of 14 billion. Ireland is saying, no, we're totally happy with like 0.005 effective taxes on Apple. Um, whoever wins, and it might well be that Ireland wins this case, that was a decision at the general court, global negotiators have put in place a, a treaty to ensure that large firms or giant firms pay a 
percent minimum tax. So this, this tool has huge implications for other areas. Um, and I'll also mention that in addition to the European layer, we also have national authorities that are very active in this field. Um, in addition, there is aggressive enforcement, uh, pre-approval of mergers, dawn raids, uh, in which police-style authority is uh, part of the European as well as the national system, as well as very large fines. So 10% of revenue, so not profit, but revenue, is the way we get to these uh, awards in the billions. So in our work, uh, we wanted to look at whether American or US, uh, American or European laws had spread and why. Um, we first show a, a deep rise in the number of countries that have competition laws on the books starting in 1990. Uh, we then do very detailed empirical coding of the types of provisions uh, all these countries have. Um, this is very, very small. Uh, so we have whether, for example, there's a private right of action who can bring claims. Do you need to wait for the national regulator to decide that a practice is anti-competitive, or can a competitor bring a claim? Um, so that's one of the 36 provisions in our index. Um, uh, and then uh, I'll just speak about six provisions, three very common ones, and three that were rare and have become more common. So fines are very, very common. It's always been the case that agencies can impose fines. Uh, it's uh, always been the case that price fixing has been the pragmatic, uh, mm -hmm. collusive behavior that we agree to sell at no less than some price. That's always been the case in all jurisdictions. And also that monopolies, be they uh, telecoms, be they tech giants, uh, cannot abuse their position to charge excess profits. Some provisions from the data that were not common in 1950 but are very common today have to do with um, output restraints. Can you, in the private context, do what OPEC, the cartel uh, for oil, is doing and say, we'll create, well, this is the maximum we will produce and let the market raise the price? That has now become illegal. Market sharing, um, so I'll sell in the north part of the country, you'll sell in the south. That has now been recognized as a pragmatic uh, restriction, and merger notification, as I said, um, has also spread very widely. Um, this is a map of the world of what's happened, where green is those countries that are converging to the US, to the EU rather than the US model, and it's really quite striking that you have all of the countries in the Americas uh, converging, or many countries in the Americas, converging not to the US, but to the EU. And I'll speak a little bit about why that is in a moment. Um, so why is this the case? Um, there's a couple of push factors here. One is preferential trade agreements. Um, so we've collected data on what the EU requires when it forms an agreement with a country to say, we will open uh, up our market and you will open yours. And as a condition of access to EU markets, an antitrust agreement, very much like the EU, that the EU is put on the table, where the US does not put those conditions in its PPAs as frequently. Um, another key idea is that large firms, this is my co-author Anu Bradford's term, it's called the Brussels effect, is that you can't have a merger for these giant companies approved in one jurisdiction and blocked in another. So you end up complying with the laws of the strictest uh, jurisdiction if you must operate in that market. Um, but there are also some other pull factors that are very interesting. One is that the European model, unlike the American model, allows for goals that are not purely consumer welfare, for example, the protection of small and medium enterprises, the protection of competitors. Um, some regional efforts are more uh, acceptable to Europeans and to leaders around the world. And to me, what's most striking is a technological feature of the way in which EU is drafted. So in order to draft a directive or a regulation, there's some consultation across the member states on what is a norm that could work in these 27 states. And then this is put on a website and translated in a bunch of languages. And we've found that those translations just happen to be super helpful for legislators around the world. So it's just ease of having a comprehensive, short legal document. You don't need to go into the case law. You don't need to understand the details. You have it in your language. And uh, 
legislators who are stretched for resources just use uh, the EU templates. What is happening uh, with big tech? Uh, so US authorities are investigating. The EU is passing uh, extensive legislation. Um, there's this question of the defense of the companies is, look, essentially network effects require us to be large. It doesn't make sense to break up Facebook into 15 companies because then you won't find your friends. You need everyone to be on the same network. Um, should we regulate them? Should we break them up? Should we do nothing? Uh, the tech giants are huge. Uh, their annual revenue exceeds $25 billion. Um, however you define the market, that's usually the question in antitrust enforcement. They're pretty dominant. Um, the American Congress is very polarized. Republicans and Democrats agree on very little. They all believe there's something we should do on uh, big tech, but it's very hard for them to do anything. And instead, what the Europeans have done is said, we won't wait to impose fines after the violation happens. We will pass these two big statutes, the Digital Markets and the Digital Services Act. They come into effect this year. They basically affect the largest American companies um, because of this concept of gatekeeper on which uh, Professor Mikulea will elaborate. So they allow for these, they have broad extraterritorial reach. They apply to the US. They have very steep fines, 6 to 20% of revenue of all the money coming in, a lot of enforcement, very significant obligations. So if you're looking for law jobs, there'll be lots of compliance uh, jobs. Uh, and the goal is to regulate the internet, to create the same expectations we have in person, online, uh, to think about cybersecurity, to think about data and evidence sharing. Um, who are the firms? The commission has not yet told us, even though uh, the, um, this will be implemented starting this year. It's almost certainly Amazon, Apple, Google, and Meta. But the threshold is so high, you need 45 million active users plus a turnover of 7.5 billion. So Wikipedia, for example, has many more users but makes no money. Um, so they don't meet the threshold. They're trying to get a European firm in, on this list to um, say, look, we're not totally parochial, we're not trying to um, block um, American firms, we're trying to protect European consumers and consumers around the world, but it's certainly these large American companies, uh, and the gatekeepers cannot do all the practices that we find controversial. So over-promoting uh, their own products, having, for example, Amazon put their own products on top, having Apple, kind of the iPhone, get 30% uh, of every app on the iPhone, um, a lot of protections for data usage, a lot of uh, prohibitions on pre-installing software. There's also the Digital Services Act, which applies to a much broader range of online intermediary services, um, hosting services, online platforms, and very large online platforms. And what they do is protect uh, minors as well as adults who might have sensitive information as regards their health or their orientation. They put in place requirements that seem very aggressive. So uh, hate speech, according to this uh, text, is supposed to be taken down within 24 hours. And there's lots of cooperation between EU authorities in terms of in times of crisis, be it a pandemic, a terrorist attack, uh, and so forth. Let me end by thinking about the big picture impacts on uh, the presentation to uh, Professor Mikulea, who I think takes a different perspective on uh, some of this. I will argue that this aggressive uh, EU antitrust law does a lot for consumers, for European consumers, for American consumers, for consumers around the world. However, we face a big strategic dilemma. That is, we're at a moment when the West is breaking off with China and Russia. And we have at least three tech giants in China that are much bigger than the ones we're familiar with. There's the firewall that totally blocks us from that technology. And there's a real question about whether by uh, limiting what Western firms can do, we are opening up the space for the Chinese government to support these Chinese giants uh, to do every harmful activity that we are uh, prohibiting. Uh, thank you so much. So thank you very much for this brilliant presentation, uh, Katerina. Uh, 
we saw that's in a perfect way how Linacan's attempts have proven unsuccessful and how EU law uh, has dominated the scene and has uh, somehow created, let's say, a wider regulatory paradigm uh, across the board. Um, I think that uh, the big firms know somehow in many instances how to overcome uh, the, uh, the, the obstacles raised by competition law. Uh, there is a very interesting book recently, not much recently, okay, lately, uh, published by Katarina Pistor, uh, The Code of Law. Uh, in this book, uh, Katarina Pistor uh, shows how uh, the law and the legal tools uh, may pave the way for circum circumventing those principles of territoriality and nationality. So, uh, I pass on the floor now to Alexandra, to Professor Mikulea. Um, before I do that, uh, some recommendations. Uh, Alexandra is Professor of Commercial Law at Athens Law School, at our law school. Uh, she's founding partner at Mikulea, Taikuras and Associates. Uh, and of counsel at Kutalidis Law Firm, dealing with competition law issues, as we may all imagine. She's also a member uh, of the Steering Committee of European Law School Network. Uh, she has served as a special expert for the Hellenic Competition Commission and subsequently as a member of it. She has an extensive research activity, both in Greece and abroad and has served as a member of lawmaking committees in the fields of commercial law, competition law, banking law, capital markets law, trademark law, and consumer protection law. She has participated uh, as organizer and speaker in numerous conferences and events, and she has also published numerous articles and books in her area of practice, especially in competition law. So, now uh, she's going to focus uh, on uh, big tech corporations and uh, especially when they're purchasing uh, startups. So um, her main concern would be uh, with those concentrations that are not notified to, their, uh, to the authorities uh, due to the fact that they do not have the relevant turnover. Uh, several solutions have been brought forward, amongst others, for instance, uh, the reversal of, bar of the burden of proof. So you are going to present us how the big corporations may, must demonstrate what they are not, uh, that they are not buying in order to kill uh, a startup, or the so-called referral procedure to the EU. So at the end of the day, uh, the question is, should we do something uh, against uh, such, uh, um, such strategies or leave things up to the invisible hand of the markets? Let's hear more about Alexandra's liberal, I think, orientation. Well, that's for sure, Antonis. I, I said uh, uh, to friends and colleagues that it is very nice to, to deal with modern issues, okay, but it's not modern not to be conservative. <laughs> okay. <laughs> for sure. Okay, um, let's talk about uh, killer acquisitions, dear friends and dear colleagues. Uh, what is a killer acquisition, as we already know, is a case in which the acquiring firm strategy is to discontinue the development of the target innovation projects and, and preempt future competition. This is a systematic acquisition of actual or potential competitors with a small turnover in order to show future competitive pressure. Where do we find this problem? In GAFAM cases, that's for sure. The last years, uh, 400 acquisitions have been made from GAFAM, uh, Google, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, but not only in the, big in the big tech industry, but also in pharmaceutical industry. The killer acquisitions are there. In the US pharmaceutical market, the share of killer acquisitions in the total number of acquisitions of pharmaceutical companies amount to 7,4%. What our friend Vestager says, the commission keeps hearing that big digital businesses might be locking paths that deliver innovation to consumers, that promising ideas 
from small innovators can disappear because bigger businesses buy them in order to kill them. What also Joe Simmons said from FTC, one of our interests in this area will be mergers of high-tech platforms and nascent competitors. These type of transactions are particularly difficult for antitrust enforcers to deal with because the acquired firm is not a full-fledged competitor and the likely level of competition with the acquiring firm is often not apparent. Facebook, Instagram, that was the first case. Is it a killer acquisition or not? Nobody knows. But it was one of the first uh, acquisitions. Instagram, 2012, has uh, 12 employees and no turnover, but it had 35 um, people, users. So uh, Facebook bought Instagram for $1 billion, if I, if I remember correctly. Uh, the theories of harm that were assessed, but uh, it was about horizontal over overlap in the market for photo application, as both companies are, were active in the same market. Loss of potential competition, as Instagram could become a competitor to Facebook in the social media services market. And third, input for closure, given the possibility that Facebook's competitors in the social media services market may be foreclosed from access or quality of access to Instagram's photo application. These three theories of harm were assessed but rejected. Because why? Because photo applications were not considered attractive to advertisers since users do not spend enough time using them. And secondly, because the strategic exclusionary incentive was also underestimated with the assumption or with a false assumption that Instagram's popularity would decrease significantly if Facebook changed its policy terms of use. Nobody knows if it is, uh, there are some empirical evidence right now and also in the United States, and they say we're not sure that that was a killer acquisition. Although everybody talks about that, the evidence that uh, now is in the United States, they are skeptical because they believe that this takeover uh, should not have been blocked, if I'm not correct, if I'm not mistaken. So when the, the whole uh, idea started, with this uh, study, with 2018 Cunningham study, and they talked about the pharmaceutical sector and highlighted the concerns about killer acquisition. It was found that when companies in the industry acquired new entrants, the pipeline drugs of the acquired companies had a lower likelihood of growth if the acquirer's business portfolio already included overlapping drugs. And that's the key question, the overlaps. The study estimated that approximately 5 to 7% of the examined acquisitions could be categorized as killer acquisitions, indicating that the growth potential of the acquired companies was significantly hindered. Someone can say that this 5 to 7% is relatively small. It is small, but uh, nevertheless, it is significant for the innovation procedure. The two sides of the same coin. From one part, we have the acquisition of technology or skilled personnel that is necessary in order to develop new products for the benefit of consumers. But from the other side, we have the idea that through killer acquisitions, we maintain a dominant position and what is the result is the elimination of, competitive, uh, of competition. We have also the reverse killer acquisitions. What is this? That's the idea that, uh, uh, what is this idea? That the companies are already, they having the money, they having the resources, they having the funding in order to have a new product. But after they see this acquisition, the target company, they decide not to go to, go to do the acquisition in order to have their own production. That's the reverse uh, killer acquisition, in what sense that the buyer uh, has no uh, innovation efforts anymore. What are the theories of harm? The theories of harm have to do with limitation of potential competition first, and second with innovation harm. Is this something new? Which are the main concerns? The problem is that we have many uh, measures that they flow under the radar, they don't have 
the, the turnovers in order to notify the concentration. And the second problem is, for me, is the so-called type one errors and type two. Type one yeah. means wrong intervention, and type two error means wrong non-intervention. Which are the main concerns we have to uh, protect innovation, not to destroy innovation? Which are the, the questions that have to be answered? Will the target startup be able to remain independent, and if so, will be able to become a credible competitive force in the market? That's the first question. Will it be able to secure access to sufficient private funding? Because everybody knows that, OK, we're talking about killer acquisitions, but the startup companies want to be bought. So they want the funding. They have the idea. But they want also that something like that happens. Second, will the target startup be able to be acquired by an alternative investor? And if so, will it be able to become a credible competitive force in the market? Because it's something that we are looking for, that the startup company has to be a credible competitive force. Is it going to do it? Can it do it? Is there any other possibility that the new player may enter the market and act as a disruptor? And is it possible that the buyer could find an alternative target startup or to develop its own alternative product internally? Because from what I understand, the idea is that the company has to um, develop its own product to buy, not to buy, but to build. That's the idea that comes from the whole rhetoric. Not to build, not to buy, to build. But can we force the companies, can we oblige the companies in a liberal society not to buy and only to product, to, only to, to, uh, uh, to do uh, its own work? That's the big question to be answered. The innovation theory of harm is, in, is something new. No, it's not something new. It is in the antitrust uh, academic literature. It is in jurisprudence. And we have this uh, case, Dow DuPont case. And it was stated that uh, the reduction of competitors from five to four means innovation harm. That had nothing to do with uh, big tech, with digital economy, but had to do with, um, uh, with agriculture uh, sector. In this decrease in innovation, how it was stated, that uh, the Commission acknowledged that the merger would probably result in a decrease in innovation by disrupting, displaying, or redirecting the overlapping research and product development efforts of both parties. What it was crucial in this decision? First, from five to, to four, first. And secondly, that the companies have overlapping activities in research, and the Commission says it's something very dangerous because they are going to get rid of the new of the, um, the of uh, further research and product development. So, if we are going to accept, we are going to clear this measure. The uh, the um, the companies has to do the divestment. That means they have to um, get away of uh, a, a, of these DuPonts, herbicides, and insecticides businesses. So it was a divestment in order that the company uh, be free of this, and another competitor has this uh, herbicides and insecticides business department. Facebook Zifu. Here comes the CMA, United Kingdom. Not the Stagger anymore, but uh, the CMA is stronger, I think. And more, uh, it's different, the CMA, and after Brexit also. Zifu, you know, everybody, you know Zifu. Jiffy Business consists of providing an online database and a search engine that allows the user to search and share the so-called GIFs, digital files in which a short uh, video without sound is there, and also the GIF stickers. Jiffy had around, at that time, 15,000 GIFs, as opposed to today's more than 1 billion GIFs. Jiffy was a company that uh, it was not operating efficiently and wanted from the United States to be present in England. It wanted that to be uh, done. But unfortunately, CMA comes and says, we have theories of harm here. 
at the horizontal level, concerns were expressed as to the unilateral effect resulting from the loss of potential competition in display advertising, or horizontal problem. At the vertical level, concerns were expressed, were expressed as for the impact of the transaction in the social media market due to the possible foreclosure of a significant input. We have a vertical merger here. So the theories of harm were horizontal and vertical. And the CMA says, I don't care if Jiffy wants to come to Europe. For me, it's important that we have the substantial lessening of competition in the social media market and online advertising market. And the CMA blocked the merger and obliged the companies to do the divestiture to sell the Jiffy. It's a very interesting case, and it's different from the other. Meta within United States. That's a case that I like a lot. In what sense? Facebook announced the acquisitions of within. Within is a company in virtual reality and the creator of the popular uh, fitness application Supernatural that has to do with metaverse. The FTC filed a request for, a, for, a, in, for an injunction before the U.S. District Court of uh, California to prohibit the transaction. Lina Khan was there. Lina Khan wanted that to be stopped. Why? Because Meta is, Meta is Facebook, has a dominance, but uh, why do Meta has to buy uh, this supranational within Meta? What uh, FTC says could have developed a fitness application to compete with within Supernatural, which could have provided an additional alternative to users, thereby pushing third-party developers to work harder in order to improve their own apps. There was no dominance in the market of virtual reality. There was no dominance in the market of metaverse. But still, uh, FTC and Lina Khan says we should prohibit because we are afraid of Facebook and why Facebook has to take so much activity in metaverse. But the court in the United States, in California, I don't know the, let's see, declined to stop Meta from acquiring the virtual reality content maker, rejecting the regulator's concern about the deal, about the innovation hub. The court was not persuaded about that. But the, the, it's still ongoing. This is still an ongoing case. Do we need some, um, some solutions, some alternative solutions? It's a big academic discussion how to deal with these acquisitions. And if they are killer or not, we have to find, found, find out that uh, further. So it's a, a, in Germany and in Austria, there is the, a, an alternative jurisdictional threshold. We have to take care of the value of the transaction. So in Germany, not now, some years ago, they decided to have a threshold of value transaction. But that means that if the value of the transaction is four, no, 500 million euros, then we have to notify this merger. Because regardless of the fact there is no turnover, there is no um, money there, there is no employees, we don't care. We see the value of the transaction. So if it is 500 million um, euros, it has to be notified. And in Austria, there is 200 million euros. So it's a different alternative criterion. In America, they are in the United States, there is a big discussion. There are six um, provisions, new provisions in Congress from 2021. And they are talking about this reverse of burden of proof, that the companies have to, to prove that they do not buy something to heal it. But these, uh, these bills are still in Congress. I don't know what is going to happen, but if I'm not mistaken, they are still there. And in uh, uh, European Union, we have the regulation of the DMA, and there is an obligation in Article 14 that the gatekeeper's company, the GAFAM, they have to notify to the commission everything that they intend to buy. 
So it's an ex ante obligation for the gatekeepers, regardless of the fact that they have to notify in Greece, in Germany, in Italy. We don't care about that. But we do care that if we have a gatekeeper company with core platform services, they have to do the notification ex ante to the Commission in order for the Commission to decide what to do further. Under what criterion, I don't know, but they still it's an obligation. What the Commission already done? We have this guidance, this guidance about Article 22. This is the referral procedure. What does it mean? That was a Holland um, case. Holland didn't have merger notification many years ago. And what did they do? They said, OK, we do not have merger notification procedure, but let's send everything we have in the in European Commission in order for the European Commission to decide if it's something dangerous or not, if there are concerns for competition or not. And this is 22, Article 22 of the merger regulation. So the Commission comes and says, we are going to use the Article 22 of this merger regulation in order for the European Commission to examine cases that has to do with startup companies. And when do we have a startup company, a company that is innovative, it is an actual or potentially significant competitive force, has access to competitively important assets, just like data. If you have one, two, three, four, and it is a startup company, then it has to do the procedure of 22 of merger regulation in order for the commission to decide if it's something wrong or not. And not only that, we have December 2022 practical information guide, a guide that says, be careful, uh, member states. We have the Article 22. So you have to be careful if we have social networks and it uh, measures, pharmaceutical sector, biotechnology, music distribution sector, and laboratory equipment sector. In these cases, you should be careful and come to me with this referral procedure. And we have the first case, Illumina Grail. That was the first case that uh, American companies that uh, um, they that uh, the, this merger was with referral procedure from uh, Belgium, Netherlands, Greece, uh, although the company is not active in European countries. They are not active, but still it was a referral procedure uh, from the member states to European Commission. Illumina is the most important manufacturer of equipment for genetic testing for disease detection. Okay, Illumina has the infrastructure. Grail has developed the Gale, the Gallen. It's a system that it says uh, it can detect cancer using liquid biopsy technology. Illumina has the infrastructure. Grail has this gallery system. Um, they said once Illumina, what was the fear, the concern? Once Illumina acquires and reintegrates Grail, it will have an interest in keeping for itself the best and most modern machines for carrying out this cancer blood test. Illumina argues that, in fact, all other companies are technologically far behind Grail because Grail is there. We do not have results from Grail, but it's still there is no competition at all, at all. That's what Illumina says. But the European Commission says, I don't care. It's something very much important for consumer welfare. We, I, we have to block the transaction. And so did US blocked the transaction and ordered divestiture. Do we have another criterion? We have a new case, tower cast decision from European uh, ECJ. Here, we it was a prelim preliminary ruling, and it was said that we have 102 TFU, it's abuse of dominance. If we have to deal with killer acquisitions, with acquisitions that they are uh, that, that that they don't have the threshold to be notified, let's see if we can use the 102 that is the abuse of dominance to check it with this criterion and not with alter altering the merger notification obligation. And do we have another idea to solve this problem? Ecosystem. It's a word that I'm not 
I don't know if I understand what exactly does it, but ecosystem theories of harm in digital measures. It's something very new and uh, it, it's a huge academic um, fight. We have this ecosystem uh, to this major case, Microsoft Activision. And again, CMA is here, again, England is here, and says we have to block this major again. So yeah, just a few details. Microsoft's presence in gaming extends beyond its Windows operating system with its Xbox console. The young colleagues here know, know much more about uh, consoles, Xbox, and PlayStation. My sons also. <laughs> yes, <laughs> besides us. <laughs> so Microsoft has to do with Xbox. Microsoft has also cloud, cloud computing infrastructure. Activision is a major game, game publisher, lacks its own cloud gaming infrastructure, and focuses on developing games for PCs, consoles, and mobile devices. The CMA's investigation focused on the vertical impact of the proposed acquisition on console gaming and cloud gaming services, considering overlaps and potential effects on competition in these areas. The CMA blocked the acquisitions, but what it is interesting, clearance of this merger is in, the night, is in China, Saudi Arabia, Brazil, Serbia, Chile, Japan, South Africa, Ukraine, and the EU. Everybody says yes, CMA says no, and I think also the United States is pending. Pending, pending. Okay, and what do we have here? The CMA identified the potential harm of Microsoft making Activision games exclusive to its own cloud gaming offering. So it sees exclusivity and foreclosure. In which market? In cloud gaming offering. The CMA highlighted Microsoft's ability to steam games via Xbox Cloud Gaming and Azure without additional licensing fees. So what we say, here we, it's going to be a problem, a, a dominance, as um, a problems in competition in this cloud uh, market. But in the United in Euro, in European Union, and I find it's a better solution not to block necessary the measure, but to find another solution. That is what I'm talking about. In European Commission, they said, we clear the, the acquisition, but with remedies. And what does it mean, remedies? They obliged Microsoft to give licenses for 10 years for consumers and for service providers in order not to have the foreclosure of other uh, companies in the cloud gaming market. So there are solutions not to destroy everything necessarily, not to block necessarily everything, but to, to see if there is another solution. And commitments means that we have someone to check about the commitments if they are fulfilled. And if after these 10 years or in between find, we found other concerns, then OK, we can proceed with something else, but not from the very first time, say, block. So, Ecosystem as a solution. What Christina Kafara is one of the best uh, and well known. She wrote an article uh, some days ago, 5th of June 2023. And she said, In this decision, I find the word ecosystem. And what is ecosystem? Is everything, assets, every asset that I have. I have cloud, I have Windows operating system, I have first and third party games. I have a list of assets. I have also important content. I have everything. That is ecosystem. Different activities all together with inter interchanged and uh, organized from one company. So I have an ecosystem. In this CMA decision, it is 200, 300 pages. There is the word ecosystem. But the final prohibition decision from CMA says, OK, we have the ecosystem, we have this uh, lessening of competition, but they end up with a conventional input foreclosure, uh, that the companies are going to have the incentive and the ability 
to uh, exclude competitors. So uh, there is a big um, discussion about if we, if we use ecosystem, is it going to be a solution to forbid something? That's the discussion. And I'm coming and say, OK, I don't like the word ecosystem. Ecosystem is something uh, in environmental, but not, not necessarily. But OK, let's find a major specific um, idea, a major specific case. How we must develop criteria in order to see the new portfolio that is coming, the new, acquisition, the, the new acquired and the target. Are they having additional market power? How? By insulating the buyer from current and future competition, by creating greater asymmetries, by holding relevant assets, by increasing barriers to entry and expansion. Let's find criteria to go on further with that. Not break up, not having ecosystems and other solutions, but cri developing criteria in order to set the limits. And in this way, we can have this legal certainty for the companies, for the regulators, and for consumers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexandra, uh, for this excellent and really thought-provoking presentation. You put so many things on the table. I think there, both of you, um, there is so much to discuss. Um, I will open up the discussion uh, just after a few uh, remarks of mine. Uh, so um, uh, it might be naive uh, to suggest that uh, am I allowed to buy something in order just to kill it? Uh, let's uh, uh, let's think of a tangible object, uh, of a house, of a painting. Am I allowed to do that? In principle, yes. Right? Uh, but the problem steps in when uh, the harm principle knocks on our door. So when uh, third parties are harmed or damaged. Uh, so competitors in the relevant market or when there are, uh, let's say, um, collective goods that are at risk. Let's say the distortion of the market, and so on and so forth. Uh, but the motive still counts. Okay, we're, we're talking about the motive here, and the effects, the possible negative effects, upon the operation of the market. Um, This is also, I think, the rationale or the reasoning behind this meta within case, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Alexander, as you mentioned. Uh, there is this domino effect, the far reaching effects of such a merger, of such acquisition uh, uh, on the market. Uh, but uh, at the end of the day, or in essence, uh, we're talking about a transaction here that runs against good morals as a civil lawyer would. Thank you so much uh, for s staying here through the Q&A. Um, I'll start by briefly addressing Professor Karabatos' comment. In what field does it make sense? Is it profitable to take an asset and to destroy it? Where else might we have that regulation? And I was thinking that in real estate, we often have developers who want to tear something down in order to destroy it and build something more profitable, and we have very nice distinctions about what you can and cannot turn down because of the public value. Uh, so maybe that would be a model to think through under what circumstances uh, should killer acquisitions be permissible. The other two questions uh, from Professor Bellis and Ms. Rathi are very hard, like how to think about the future. Um, we've all thought about it in the COVID case when we have these curves where something will grow exponentially. Most uh, viruses will not. Most of the time, all of the preventive measures will put real costs on people without uh, the benefits. But on occasion, the rise of a company, we will just miscalculate. I think the Instagram case that Professor McCrulay is that paradigmatic example, and then a divestiture after the fact is uh, proposed, but very difficult. Um, so how to address that threat and how to address the Chinese threat, I think, are even harder. Um, the value idea, I think, seems like a very sensible one. Like, if Facebook believes this is worth uh, hundreds of millions, like, 
that's a pretty safe bet uh, for regulators. That doesn't seem uh, over uh, overreach. Um, on the Chinese threat, I think Americans and Europeans see things quite differently um, right now. For example, the very concrete case of what to do about TikTok in this field, where the occasional American legislature is thinking of banning it because of data shared with Chinese authorities and Europeans who say, well, you know what, like we don't think uh, data sharing should go through with the U.S. government because we also know that the U.S. government had cooperated far too much with these tech companies under its own security laws, so we're not quite sure that we can trust the U.S. or the Chinese. Um, so I think that's kind of the concrete illustration, but I think that's, that's tiny. I think the real threats are um, in artificial intelligence, the fact that the Chinese Anything in China just grows so much faster than it does any place else. That there, they have three giants, and they firewall the rest of the world out of it. They have in sectors that require very big investments. Um, so we think of aerospace as, for example, the paradigmatic field where like antitrust law should apply because barriers to entry are huge. They're like, yes, we have set up a competitor to Boeing and Airbus within. A few years, so I think the the threats we have there are uh, much bigger than than digital. Thank you, Katerina, and the comments. Thank you, Katerina. <laughs> okay, let let's start. What I I used to say to my students, and you know, Anton, if you have uh, heard me talking about that. And my students, my colleagues there already know it's about this idea of hipster antitrust. Uh, sorry about that. <laughs> hipster antitrust and our new brand I school and everything that it is in the United States and it's coming in Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, uh, although the professor Lanos from UCL, who, who is the president of the Land Competition Commission. Uh, has written many articles about this polycentric competition law. Everything is there. Everything should be there. Democracy, inequality, rich and poor, small enterprises, pra uh, data, everything is there. That's the polycentric uh, idea. Um, and also the, the hipster antitrust. And why is this antitrust? Because uh, um, somebody in Congress when he was talking about these new bills in the United States, he said, what is this? What are all these new legislation, all the, these new bills? Am I a hipster? How he reacted to this move. Um, so I do want that the, the goals of competition law should not be altered. That's my idea. But OK, that's the first of all. The second thing is about China, as we are talking about. In the uh, United Kingdom, there is a new, com it's something different, competition policy and something different, industrial policy. Two different things. A government has its own tools to go further with regulation, with uh, industrial policy, but competition is something different. Um, in the uh, United Kingdom, there is this uh, provision uh, that they, are, they can block a merger the CMA can block a merger in accordance with uh, the government. Why? Because they, they, there are safety reasons because of China and the other countries. But they are coming and merge and they buy companies in the United Kingdom. In Deutschland, in Germany, uh, there is a, a provision, but not in Bundeskartellamt, but uh, that's a decision of the government that if they found out that a merger is going to be dangerous for the safe, for safety reasons, they can block it. We used to have such a provision, but we abolished it. But uh, the CMA, the, the, the United Kingdom, has this new regulation one, two years ago because of the fear of the China, uh, China undertakings that are going to acquire everything in Europe. Maybe that is a, a solution to go further. What about uh, ecosystem? Um, ecosystem is not what I like. I, maybe I said it, uh, um, I, I made a mistake. I am against ecosystem. Okay, what? Ecosystem. Ah, yes, I put it bluntly. Okay, uh, uh, for me, legal certainty means 
that we have to evaluate each case ad hoc. Each case, each me major case has to be evaluated by every competition authority with criteria. That's the legal certainty. I need the criteria to go further. It was a, a try here in Athens. Um, it was an idea to have abuse of dominance uh, in an ecosystem. That was something that um, a law committee here tried to push it. Let's forget abuse of dominance in a market and let's put it abuse of dominance in an ecosystem. And uh, when I asked what is ecosystem, because ecosystem is everything. A bank is an ecosystem. A supermarket is an ecosystem. LNE telecommunication is an ecosystem. Power energy, the e-company e is everything. If you have different activities, at the end of the day, you are an ecosystem, broadly speaking. So we, if we want to change the competition law, and uh, why do we have to uh, invent abuse of dominance in an ecosystem? Because it's going to be dangerous for a competition authority, in my opinion, and it's going to have to uh, to find out abuse of dominance in every practice of a dominant company. So dominance is not forbidden. That we have to take care of. In Germany, for example, uh, there is a, a new regulation, and it says uh, it is a, a, an abuse of dominance um, paramount significance across the markets. 19A of the So they found out not ecosystem, that's maybe the ecosystem, but they are going to check out um, abuse of dominance uh, when a company has activity across the markets. But uh, if I understand correctly the German provisions, the German provisions says uh, you can put ex ante regulation. It's not ex post, but ex ante. If you have this idea of having this activity across some markets and you are significant, then Bundeskartellamt can pose some obligation, just like the DMA, ex ante regulation is the DMA. That means not ex post and we change the competition law, but ex ante you can have your regulation regarding gatekeepers, uh, regarding companies with paramount significance across the markets, like in England we have companies with strategic market status. Everything has to do regulation. Okay, I, I agree with this kind of regulation, but not changing competition law afterwards. But okay, in between is the... And what else? What else about... Um, ah, Sandbox, as my colleague Baron says. Uh, we talked a lot about sustainability also. Is, is, is this a goal of competition law? has to be a goal also. And the idea is, yes, but we cannot accept a price fixing in order to have the sustainability goal. So we have to be care, careful not to accept the price fixing in order to have the, this idea. So there is a sandbox in LN Competition Commission. That's the first time that I see sandbox and competition law. And uh, every cooperation that is going to be made between competitors it can be there, discussed from the Alliance Competition Commission, and then say, gr give green light or red light. So it's a kind of regulation. It's something that you, the regulator, and the company talk to each other, bring the whole new idea, and then the regulator says green or red light. Mm -hmm. And uh, a reverse killer acquisition uh, means that uh, if I have already, as a buyer, started an innovation effort. I have already did it. So if I have started to be innovative, and then I see Katerina and say, mm, why do I have to give money for my idea? I see Katerina, I'll buy Katerina. That's the reverse killer. And so my effort is dead. The normal way is I don't have anything to do with this, with uh, uh, mobile phones. I have uh, uh, laptops, but not mobile phones. And uh, I I buy the new startup company in an area, area that I do not have at all. Thank you, Alexandra. Um, I think there are many new kids in town. I mean, uh, sustainability, 
we're going to hear a lot this week about sustainability in Athens uh, uh, by Stavros Gadin is also coming from Berkeley uh, School of Law. Um, sustainability also influences uh, private law and especially civil law nowadays. There is a talk about uh, a talk of um, a sustainable contract and so on and so forth. Uh, and as you described, ecosystems. Even a law professor may feel like being an ecosystem with all the activities. I mean, academic activities, administrative activities, and so on. Um, I have a question uh, before. Uh, if anyone else wants to raise a question, my pleasure. Uh, that's just a, uh, just a moment. Uh, you mentioned before that, uh, and this is an empirical, I, I suspect, issue uh, that the startups. Uh, want to be acquired, want to be bought. Uh, the question is, when they want to be bought? Uh, where is the tipping point? Are there any empirical studies about the point where um, a startup wants to be bought? To both of you. Thank you so much. Um, I'll speak to two general themes I heard. One about how we analyze these phenomena from different legal prisms that have, at times, completely different overarching goals and historical origins. And the second question I'll turn to is more specifically about the efficiency of killer acquisitions, when it makes sense financially, when it makes sense uh, financially to do something that is destructive uh, societally and perhaps some differences between pharma and tech. Um, so to put it crudely, the goal of competition policy is totally at odds with the goal of industrial policy and with the goal of national security. Um, so if we saw this in the crudest way, national security says in this sector, which would be very broad, could be very narrow, we are not going to benefit consumers, we're going to benefit domestic firms because we only trust domestic firms, Western firms, national security exemption in international law means the government does whatever they want to do, they ignore everything else. And the goal of industrial policy is pro we promote a national champion. The goal of competition policy is we don't promote a national champion. Um, so I think uh, the European legal framework in which state aid is part of competition policy is entirely peculiar. As you said, it's a huge problem that in uh, for, for car companies that in the US you can give subsidies and in Germany you cannot because of that peculiarity of European integration. And I think the world is changing. I think both the Trump and the Biden administration that otherwise don't have a lot in common are doing industrial policy on a scale not seen before. And also in looking at EU Commission documents, they have eight sectors that are exempt. The first seven make total sense, and the last one is the auto industry. I think some German lobbying might have made uh, a dent uh, there, but there is some industrial policy coming back, and as part of the pandemic, not only was there exemptions to state aid rules, but massive borrowing by the EU, so the pandemic and Ukraine absolutely changed that. Uh, to touch a little bit earlier on on the point about sustainability, sustainability is traditionally understood as a corporate law question. Is it fair for companies not uh, to focus primarily on profit, but also on these broader goals? And will shareholders be able to hold managers accountable, or will managers become completely unaccountable if they can have all these broad goals? But from a competition perspective, as Professor Mikulea uh, had in conversation on sandboxing, to the extent all of the competitors come together and say, we will meet the following standards, are they effectively price fixing? So that's a modern um, and critical question. Let me turn to this question about what happens with killer startups. When is it efficient? When is it inefficient? Uh, when, at what point uh, does a startup founder want, uh, above all else, to be bought off? And speaking to people in California who do this, they say, what I fear most is that the giant will just copy me and pay me nothing. What I would love is a very high price, and I don't care what happens thereafter. I mean, there are people who are very ideologically rigid, but for many people, it's about that price point, which is uh, not necessarily societally optimal. In pharmaceuticals in particular, um, there is this huge cost of doing uh, tests on humans. So it can be extremely profitable for a company 
to kill competitor drugs, keep on selling the older product because of the patent system and that big upfront cost in a way that is societally deeply inefficient and suboptimal. I don't know uh, that we have those peculiarities in tech. I'd be much uh, more open uh, to have a different set of efficiencies uh, in uh, technology there. Thank you, Katerina. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, what I can say is that uh, big is not something bad. And that is this mentality is uh, now nowadays that uh, if we see the GAFAM case, every, every, every company that is dominant, we are afraid of that. So big is not something bad. And I don't, don't like the ideas about this, uh, uh, as we say, structural presumptions that uh, then company has to, to prove that it's <coughs> not going to do something bad. I am in the companies, I practice the law, and uh, I, I agree, I fully agree with Professor Bacoronia. Um, innovation doesn't come necessarily from a startup company, but comes also from the big companies. So we have to do the balance test. And the balance test, the, the companies, the, all these mergers have to be notified. That's for sure. With a threshold uh, regarding the value of the transaction, just like in Germany or in Austria, with the referral procedure, procedure in European Commission, we have to take care of that. Okay, to see. But afterwards, we have to have a secure criteria. And what does I what I, what I mean with that? I don't like the idea to say that okay, we have it an acquisition of a startup company, and then that means necessarily that that will destroy innovation. That is, not, that is not correct. We have to check it and do the balance test. And that means we have to check every, the, the whole market structure, the market shares, the dominance, the barriers to entry, uh, everything. You have to see five, six, seven criteria to assess the whole merger and the whole market. So, uh, and, and in this criteria, we have the innovation also, but it's going to be one criterion and we have to check the whole picture. That's what I think is very much uh, important. Uh, and secondly, efficiencies. In this kind of evaluation, you can see also the efficiencies there. That's another criterion that has to be checked. What else? And what is important nowadays, what I, uh, I like the paradigm of uh, Al Capone, you know. He was not, uh, he was accused of murder, assassination, okay? But he was, was never for found tax guilty for that. He was found guilty for tax evasion. And I am wondering, what are we doing with competition law nowadays? We cannot. Uh, find the big companies with other regulations because they do market manipulation, consumer manipulation. I don't doubt about that. But you do, do not have to use competition law because it is uh, easier to go after these companies. So we have uh, different. Uh, we have the regulations here and competition law here. And uh, what else? I um, somebody asked about uh, reluctance. If the com you know, competition law is not in a vacuum, as we say. It has to do with political ideas, with social ideas. It is in our um, idea of living. So Professor uh, Biden has, uh, has gone to Lina Khan, who is a famous student. She was famous as her LLM uh, study about uh, Amazon case and how to, uh, to, to check these cases. And, and Tim student, Yu, student of uh, Elizabeth Warren. Yes, no. exactly. Mm -hmm. Tim Yu was also a, a, someone who worked with Biden. He's a famous professor of, Colu of uh, Columbia, and he was together with Biden. And that way we see Biden, Lina Khan, they, they are trying to change the idea of competition law in the United States. But as far as I'm not mistaken, uh, the courts in the United States are more conservative, and they are not prepared for the new ideas. In comparison to Europe, we see the Sager, we see CMA, and we see something different, as we already saw. And Anu Bradford has this famous book about the Brussels effect. 
the new book coming out and visual economy. Ah, okay. We're waiting for that in order to see. So uh, it's a new world, that's for sure. But we should do the right balance, check balance test. Thank you very much. Uh, just a final remark on my part. Uh, of course, there is this issue uh, of innovation, uh, but especially as regards the the big tech giant, the tech giant, uh, there is also an issue of democracy and the threat to democracy. And you are right to point in pointing out that we also seek through. Uh, the regulatory tool of competition law uh, also to fight against to counter this threat to democracy. Uh, we've got to find ways in order to protect democracy against this superpower of those tech giants, but uh, the jury is still out, so <laughs> we must uh, search for, uh, for regulatory tools. Uh, and such discussions, such wonderful discussions as we had today, I think that uh, are moving in this direction. Uh, I would like to express my warm, my warm thanks to both of you, to both speakers, uh, to uh, Professor Katerina Linos and to Professor Alexandra Mikulea uh, for their excellent presentations and this great discussion we had, and to all of you for participating uh, in today's uh, ceremony in today's final, let's say, lecture, last dance of the LLM program. So uh, uh, we have some drinks waiting for all of us uh, outside uh, the room. Thank you very much for being with us. Today.